Good morgen. I'm going to do this entire speech in Norwegian. You ready? So I got to tell you how thrilled I am to be the first speaker when everybody partied last night. I, on the other hand, went to bed. Well, I, actually, I didn't go to bed at all because I'm not used to the sunlight thing.、Uh, but I turned in early to prep for today, and I suddenly realized my six-year-old daughter. Now I know how she feels when she has to go to bed early and everybody else gets to stay up partying. <laughs> so I got to tell you, it's an absolute pleasure to be here with you today. I've been so looking forward to this. But I have to disclose, I've changed my presentation a little bit. I've been talking to people over the last couple days, and I realized people didn't really know where Silicon Valley is. And let me just disclose: before I moved there eight years ago, I didn't know where Silicon Valley was. Not only did I not know where Silicon Valley was, I'd never heard the word venture capital. I'd never heard private equity, term sheet, pre, post money, B to B, B to C. None of that. It was all completely foreign to me, because we moved to Silicon Valley eight years ago, and I moved there reluctantly. And I say reluctantly because it was my husband who got a job and came home one day and said, "We're moving to California," and I said, "The hell we are!" And he goes, "The hell we are!" <laughs> and so you see who won. But I was entrenched in this culture of Washington D.C. I had worked in national politics. I'd worked on our Capitol Hill. I went over to the White House, and then I fell into media during that great Clinton Monica Lewinsky scandal. So I ended up being with CNN the next ten years of my life, just discussing politics in Washington. You want to talk about two industries that are incredibly good. That wrote the rule books on how to prey on people. So when I came to Silicon Valley, June 10th, 2006, it was shocking to me because it was such a dichotomy of anywhere else. And I'm going to talk specifically about the geographics just to explain where it is. But then we're going to get past that because what Silicon Valley is is a mindset. It's not a geographic place. And as we're all appreciating, and we heard from Professor Nordstrom yesterday, regionalization is really driving the future of economies. It's less about the nation state anymore. So, just to show you with my handy dandy laser here, San Francisco is up here. Here's San Jose down here, and it's about depending on where you're coming from, San Francisco, and where you're going in San Jose. It's roughly about 45. Miles, 70 kilometers, something like that, apart from one another. But what makes the area so unique, right in here, is that you've got these mountain ranges, and they call it a bowl-like area, and that's what gives the intimacy. We we do not consider Silicon Valley a big city whatsoever. In fact, it's made up of, of small towns. So Google, I'm sure you've heard of, is based in Mountain View. Facebook in Menlo Park, Yahoo, Oracle, Hewlett Packard, Intel, Apple—all these companies are roughly 50 kilometers apart from one another. So when I arrived in Silicon Valley, I was stunned because the, the three things that were most apparent to me in the beginning were: where are all the big high-rises? You know, back on the East Coast where I came from, power and your level of So-called level of power was based on what floor, how high up you were, whether you had that corner office. Well, in Silicon Valley, you'll see massive campuses, but they're all two to three stories high. So we say in Silicon Valley that if you fail and you feel like jumping from the roof of the building, you can only jump two to three stories. So you'll sprain your ankle, and then you'll pick yourself back up and get started all over again the next day. Whereas the dichotomy on the East Coast after the crash of 1929, people were jumping to their deaths from these big buildings. So that was really unusual to me. The second thing I noticed immediately, I noticed a lot of women driving very fancy sports cars, and we're talking Porsches, Ferraris, Teslas, of course. 
And I came to realize that women in Silicon Valley were very much in the, jump, the driver's seat. And that was just a really interesting case study to me from, from the get-go. And the third thing I noticed is everybody smiles and they talk to one another. So I arrived in Silicon Valley and I'd be standing in line at Starbucks or the grocery store or the bank and people would say to me, how are you? What's, what's your story? What can I do for you? And that what can you do for me led me to sitting down with venture capitalists at Kleiner Perkins and other big firms. And within six weeks, I had raised seed money of $250,000 that led to a $5 million round to build out my first company. And that would have never happened in Washington, DC. So you talk about collaboration and the story that we heard earlier today, and you realize the magic, what can happen when people actually look out for each other. So I want to start with a short video that I have for you. As I sat to think about writing this book, I thought about the what ifs. What would happen if these things didn't happen in Silicon Valley? So what makes Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley? I spent six years trying to figure it out. I'm still trying to figure it out because you cannot put it in the context of the United States. My background is in economics, educationally, and after our worst financial crisis uh, of this century, Silicon Valley did not experience what the rest of the country was experiencing, much less the rest of the world. It was basically immune from the economic crisis. So what was it about this place that made it so unique? So the book was really about the hows and whys, really capturing the culture of what it is, the ecosystem. And while Silicon Valley had been written about from an academic standpoint, no one really questioned kind of deeper the human component of it, because I felt it was the human component that made a difference. And it was going to determine whether you could replicate it or not. So I thought deeply and really looked around and started laying out what I thought what the ecosystem was about. And there's no way you can write this book without going back to the founding of Stanford University. Has anybody been to Stanford? One, two, a couple more over here. Well, it's, it's one of these places you, you hear about it, but until you actually see it, you can't appreciate the beauty of the place. And notice yesterday, Professor Nordstrom did not talk about Stanford University as his list of irrelevant education, because when you are on the campus of Stanford University, you realize how far ahead, how forward thinking it is. And so I want to take you back 130 years to the founding of Stanford University, because it's really critical, because I feel, had it not been for Leland Stanford, we wouldn't have this culture that we had today. 
So let me introduce you to the Stanford family. This is Leland and Jane, his wife, and their son, Leland Jr. And the Leland Stanford family was, was based in New York, but Leland Sr. was very, very interested in the gold rush. He wanted to come west. He wanted to figure out what all this excitement was about. He wanted to do something new. He wanted great adventure. So he ended up leaving Jane, his wife, and he came west with his brothers for five years. And they landed in around the Sacramento Valley area. Well, years later, Jane ended up joining him, and they waited to have a child. Jane was 39 years old when she gave birth to Leland Jr. Can you imagine that back in the 1860s? I mean, you're pretty much dead at that point. I don't think life expectancy was much later than that. So this child was incredibly precious to them. They were an incredibly tight-knit family. And father and son just enjoyed so many unique, magical things that Northern California had to offer. And they had the great love for the outdoors and architecture and archaeology. And one of the things they loved to do was to take extended European vacations. And in February of 1862, or excuse me, 1884, they traveled to Athens, Greece. And the family was just having a fantastic time until tragedy struck. One day, Leland Jr. woke up, and he was very, very sick. And they realized that he had contracted typhoid fever. And so the family thought it would be best if they traveled to Florence, Italy, to be able to get the best medical care they could get for him. And they were hopeful that he was going to get better. But unfortunately, on March 13, 1884, Leland Stanford Jr. passed away two weeks before his 16th birthday. Well, you don't have to be a parent to sense that kind of loss. But in this case, the Stanfords had put everything into this child, and now he was gone. Jane was so devastated that she cabled friends back home and said, our darling boy has been taken from us. Please pray for us. Well, Leland Sr. was completely devastated, and he knew that the only way he could cope with the loss of his son was to throw himself in a project. And so Leland and Jane talked about what could they do? What, what would make sense? And they realized they were childless now and that they had a responsibility for all of California's children. But they thought about, would it make sense to open up a museum? Should we do a technical school? What can we do to commemorate our son? And they decided on a university because California was just being settled at that point. In fact, it was pretty barren in this area of Palo Alto where they decided to settle the school. So when Leland was trying to figure out what was the school, what was going to differentiate it, and he went to go talk to the presidents at Harvard and University of Pennsylvania, and he really sensed that, that there was a disconnect. There was something missing from the education people were getting on the East Coast and its direct relevance in the world. So Leland reflected back on his gold mining days. And he realized when he was there without Jane that there was a common purpose for these people coming together, people who traveled all over the world to risk their lives to go out and mine gold. And Leland and his brothers actually did not mine gold. They actually made their first fortune providing supplies for the miners, storefronts, clothing, equipment, that sort of thing. And what they came to realize is Leland was just getting exposure to all these cultures he had never known before. There were people from China and all over Latin America and Indonesia. And he realized that they couldn't speak the language, 
but still they were cohorts based on this passion for something new, something different, new ways of thinking, new ideas, new adventures. And so when he was settling Stanford University and figuring out what the mandate was, he reflected back to that time. He also reflected back to when he hired East Coast graduates for his railroad expansion. He made his big, big fortune in railroads. And again, he thought, there's something missing in the relevance of what these people are learning. And so what they decided to do at Stanford University was three mandates. First, there was going to be gender equality, which was just extraordinary at that time, because even in the East Coast, there were such few opportunities for women to get an education. The second thing that they were going to be committed to was open space. The university would be set, but it would be surrounded by open space, and it's just beautiful if you ever get an opportunity even to look on the internet and look at what Stanford looks like. It's surrounded by just this gorgeous array of mountains and palm trees. You literally want to go there and pitch a tent and stay there for the rest of your life. And the third component was, and this was most important, was that science was going to be the vanguard of what Stanford University became because Leland Stanford felt that science and technology was the future. That is what mattered. And so the next thing he did when he was planning for Stanford was he hired Frederick Law Olmsted, who was famous for building out Grand, the, uh, Central Park in New York. And if you can see in these original drawings here, it was all based and built on collaboration. There was going to be open courtyards, and that mathematicians would be able to talk to engineers who would then talk to scientists, who would then talk to humanities experts. That he felt that this importance of knowledge exchange was really critical to Stanford's success. So to this day, Stanford, as it expands, commits to these quads, this openness. And it really is extraordinary from the outside architecture into what happens inside buildings. And so on October 1st, 1891, Stanford University opened its doors to 555 students. And the first student was Herbert Hoover, who later became our 31st president, and that was strictly based on the fact that he got to the dorm first. <laughs> so this is a really critical thing, because what Leland Stanford did was he set the culture. But he didn't just leave it at those three mandates, he took it steps further. He wanted Stanford professors to be able to be out in the community that they would plan the surrounding Palo Alto from a civics and civil perspective, but also that they would sit on boards of directors and be able to consult to corporations, because he felt if he let his professors and academic staff go out, they would come back in with practical knowledge. He also believed that students could conduct research. Why should we limit age on what happens? What if someone knows at 12 years old that they're interested in longevity? Why should we limit their opportunity? And so what Stanford became was this bastion of innovation. And it built out these companies, not just in the tech world, but also companies such as Gap and Adwella and IDEO, where I'm affiliated at. Over 6,000 companies have spawned out of Stanford. Because it's not just about the ideas, but it's about let's do what we can for the execution as well. Again, collaboration. And true story about Google, which is just really fascinating to me. Larry Page, as I'm sure many of you know, wrote his dissertation on the Google algorithm, which was originally called the Page algorithm. And he never intended to build out a company. 
So he went to the Stanford licensing department because again, he was a student, a PhD student. It's, the expectation is it doesn't matter if you're a student or you're a professor who's been there 20 years, everybody gets equal opportunity. So he went to the licensure department and needed to file the intellectual property on this page algorithm. But he also wanted the help of the licensing department to take him around Silicon Valley. Let's see if we can license this technology, this algorithm, because he could see where the internet was heading, but yet realized that people were going to want to search very differently. So Louis Mueller, who was sitting at the front desk in the licensing department at Stanford, took Larry Page around, and nobody was interested. They went to all the existing search engines back then, but they couldn't find anybody who wanted to license the algorithm. So then you know what happened next? A Stanford professor wrote him a check for $250,000 to build out Google, and that's how Google became Google because he couldn't sell the license for the algorithm. So it's a remarkable place that really has set this culture that everybody seems to follow these unspoken, undocumented rules. It's kind of like you land there and you're in the middle of Oz. And my neighbor down the street likes to contradict me and he says, Stanford has this classic Wizard of Odd myth when it comes to commercializing ideas and growing companies. When you look behind the curtain, what Stanford does is not magic, it's just very practical steps and strong encouragement, much like the wizard. And so when I go back to either speak or have the opportunity to consult back to the East Coast, I think, gosh, they just don't get it. They're, it's not about hierarchy. It's not about bureaucracy. It's about working together and realizing that I can learn from my 23-year-old assistant who knows technology much better than I do, and vice versa. That there's much to be gained from recognizing that value comes in all aspects of cultures, and it doesn't matter of your age, your gender, the dialect of your voice, the color of your skin. If you have value to bring to the table, meritocracy trumps everything in Silicon Valley. So again, it's, it's less about the geographic region and more about the mindset of being able to operate in a way that I clearly was not accustomed to. In fact, when I first moved to Silicon Valley, it took me so long to unravel the, the, the place that I had come from. In Washington, D.C., its most famous saying is, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. So I did, I got a dog. And the other famous saying we have is be careful on your way up because you never know who you'll meet on your way down. And in Washington, I used to think people were fascinated with their shoes because everybody was always looking down. But what I realized later is everybody was scheming. How can I tear this person down? How can I make sure that party doesn't get ahead? And it's the same thing in New York. It's this doggy dog eat your young world. And they don't know how to get out of it. And really what it comes down to, it's just culture. It's culture as a whole, and it's culture among individuals as well. So what I came to realize is if you're an entrepreneur, this is what I classified as the 10 kind of areas of Silicon Valley, that there are a myriad of ways to get engaged. And again, as Professor Nordstrom, he could have done my speech yesterday. Uh, as he said yesterday, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you go to Silicon Valley. It's where you have the greatest path for success. Now, with crowdsourcing and crowdfunding and opportunities for people to raise money in much more diverse ways than strictly venture capital. I don't necessarily believe that. But what happens here is, if you have an idea and you haven't raised venture capital yet, you can go to a law firm like Wilson Sonsini, which is a, a big law firm right in the center of, of Silicon Valley, 
and they will recognize, you haven't raised venture capital yet, let's work with you. I believe in you, I believe in your idea. And so they may put a dollar figure around, let's do what we need to do to get you incorporated, to get you set up, to get you ready to, to seek venture capital out there. And we're gonna do this at our cost. And guess what? If you don't raise venture capital within six months, you don't need to pay it back. Because there's this realization that not everything happens like clockwork. Timing is, is critical. And in this exponential pace, who knows what the next big thing is going to be? But also what happens is you may be sitting down with Larry Sansini of Wilson Sansini, who's the name partner there. And again, he believes in you and he believes in your idea and he'll pick up the phone and he'll call his friends at Kleiner Perkin and say, you need to sit down with this person. Or maybe another venture capital firm like Sequoia. You need to talk to this woman. She's got a great idea. And so what happens is people on the sidelines serve as your cheerleaders and they make sure that you have the greatest safety net so that you're not in a position to necessarily fail, but recognize that failure is a badge of honor in Silicon Valley because we realize that if you do try and fail, you've learned. You're so much smarter than you are, were before. And so from that perspective, when you have people saying, hey, I like your idea, let, let me see what I can do for you, rather than no, or that's a stupid idea, or that's been tried before. My favorite East Coast saying was always, well, if it was such a good idea, somebody would have done it already. And so, you know, you realize that everything you think to be right can be spun on its head. And so the people in Silicon Valley never take for granted that they know everything. There always is a better way and there always is this recognition that anything is possible. I live down the street from Tesla headquarters. And when you have people like Elon Musk, who are now trying to forget everything else he's done in his past, but now trying to figure out a speed train that's gonna go faster than a jumbo jet. It leads you to believe that anything is possible. I can push my idea that much further. I can push the envelope that no idea is stupid. Every idea has potential. And so when you're in that existence, you feel free. You're not handcuffed by any rules or the way that things are done. So what I realized after writing Secrets of Silicon Valley is I had really only scratched the surface. That was just really the macro view of what the culture and the ecosystem is. And so I ended up having a conversation with my editor and I said, I think there's another book here. I think now we've got to figure out what's the mindset of the greatest innovators? How do they think? What is different about them in the way they do? So that is the book that's coming out in the fall. And while I look at risk-taking as a whole and how it enables innovation, and I look at sales and branding and marketing and intellectual property, but the, the four areas that really, really made me curious are the following. Leadership. We are lacking in leadership, not in Silicon Valley, but outside of Silicon Valley. And part of the reason is the, the East Coast mentality in the United States is still based on ownership. I've got to own this, and I've got to have the biggest building, and I've got to have the most buildings, I've got to have the most cars, and everything is about ownership for oneself. Well, what we do in Silicon Valley is we recognize that every single person in the company we're building out is responsible for the success or failure of that company. So we're going to recognize that. We're going to give you every person gets equity. And also on the East Coast, what kills companies is CEO compensation and tenure. The average Fortune 500 CEO is 4.6 years. 
Well, 4.6 years, that's the same thing as a presidential term. And we all know in the first presidential term, by the end of four years, you're just learning the job. So if you're only going to be there for 4.6 years, why not milk the company for everything you've got? And so now, the Fortune 500 CEO makes 354 times more salary than the average worker. And again, this is mostly happening on the East Coast. So that's what kills companies. What unlocks the secret of the great innovators is they think completely differently. They don't think of themselves as the big CEO at the helm of the company, got to prove themselves all the time. What they think about is they think of themselves as the chief innovation officers, the chief product officers. When I sat down with Paul Jacobs, who was the then CEO of Qualcomm, Qualcomm is the semiconductor company. It's got the chip in just about every smartphone on the planet. And we were just talking, I was interviewing him for this book, and he wanted to show me his watch. It was a smart watch. And he said, yeah, someone came up to me in the hallway and had a great idea. And I wanted, I wanted to build it out. And it was this watch. So he said to me, I went in the lab with my buddies and we sat there until we built this thing. It's the same thing with Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. He's not off in the corner office, he's in the mix of his people. Why do we want to separate ourselves from our peers, the very, very people who can make us successful or bring us to failure? These leaders also think about long-term value creation, not immediate profitability. And there is some movement uh, among more of the incumbent companies to say, enough is enough. We don't need to focus on our quarterly earnings, our daily stock prices. But you go back to these corporations on the East Coast, you go into their hallways, right in their main foyers, and there's their stock price. So are you focusing on the stock price, or are you focusing about What's going to happen five to 10 years out? How are you going to survive in these exponential times? And finally, they have conversations of what I call yes and. And what that means is no idea is a bad idea. Nothing gets squashed. It's not no, it's not yes but, it's you've got a, an idea, yes, and let's try to work it out. Let's try to fund it. Let's try to make it come to fruition. And maybe it's not for this quarter, maybe it's 18 months from now. But we've got to encourage our employees to do that best they possibly can. The next component that I just am fascinated by is, is culture. Without leadership, you can't have culture. And so I wanted to go to a company in Silicon Valley that everybody talked about. They love the culture. And NetApp was it. And, and we're fortunate, because we're going to hear from Shannon at Google next, Shannon Deegan. Nobody does culture and talent better than Google, but I'll, I'll let him talk about that. But I sat down with the CEO, and they've won all sorts of awards at NetApp, and they're the big data storage company. And I said to him, what is it about your culture? And he said, well, when we hire people, we let people know that they have the ability to change this company, that every single person can change the course of what the company is today. And I said, tell me more about that. And he said, OK, let me tell you about a billion dollar idea called FlexPod. It came from a 20-something staffer at NetApp and was able to make its way all the way up the chain to get the time it needed to really validate and make this idea and make it come to fruition. That doesn't happen on the East Coast. You can't walk up to the CEO. They walk in entourages. And so nobody could really articulate what the culture was at NetApp, so I decided I would spend nine months there, and I would just walk the hallways. And what I realized is, I hate to use the word family, but people really looked out for each other. 
and no one was in it for themselves. They all genuinely wanted this company to succeed, and it's gone through some tough times. So I said, okay, let's, let's come up with a methodology. Let's figure out what this is. And so my analysis is of NetApp is it's the culture of how. It's not what they do, but how they do it. And so what that means is 75% of the time, everybody's swimming in the same lane. They're all working together in their various divisions and departments. But 20% of the time, a day a week, people get to pursue their own individual passions, anything that benefits the company, whether it's internally or externally. Tom Jordan's told me about a time that someone wanted to go build schools in Africa. And he thought that was a great thing because you never know, while it was doing good work, but you never know how it could benefit the company. So 30 additional NetApp employees went with this person to go build schools in Africa. And it, it wasn't about the immediate return, the return on investment for NetApp, but he thought just the experience of these people being in Africa together was value in itself. So we also realized that we needed to figure out what happens if people are working on the same idea. So we needed 5% of time figuring out if there was any conflicts. And if there were, what do we do about it? So what I figured out at NetApp is it's clearly not a hierarchical culture. It's also not a flat culture. It's more of a culture that operates in an oval. And so if someone has an idea, they may be in the marketing department, they may go over to the CETO's office, the chief technology officer's office, just to talk about the idea and build upon it. And again, it was all about yes and. We're not gonna squash any ideas. We believe in you, you're part of this company, we are going to support you. And so it's just an amazing culture that even more companies in Silicon Valley can learn from. Talent. Nothing is more important than talent. You know, it used to be that all the emphasis was on product. Now, for those companies that don't realize that talent is the one that builds your product, they're going to lose out. We are moving so fast exponentially that companies that were around for 150 years, such as Eastman Kodak, are now becoming obsolete, have gone out of business in that case, but more companies are going to follow. I had a meeting with a chief strategy officer at a huge Fortune 100 company who said, I can't do anything. It's obviously much easier to start a culture rather than to inherit it. But there was nothing they could do with HR. There was nothing they could do to foster innovation by encouraging their people because they, what HR ends up doing is sucking the life out of people. They mitigate risk. They don't enable risk. They have become the function of no. But leaders have allowed it to happen. Leaders have allowed HR to grow much larger than it ever should have been in the first place. And so I work with the innovation consulting firm IDEO, and I'll just give you a quick example. And what they do is they have a mom for each individual group, and our groups are not big, they're around 30 to 50 people. And what that mom does is he or she they keep anecdotal evidence on what you want to do next. How do I make my people grow? How do I help foster them to be the best that they can? And so some of this is documented, and some of it is just stored. So if you had worked with a big company like General Electric, and you next want to work with a small entrepreneurial startup, it's noted. And every opportunity is made for that to come to fruition. And so we need to realize that we have to take care of our talent. We have to network them within the organization. I went into another company who has 85% engineering staff, and they're working on what I call 
improvisational innovation. How do good ideas bubble up from anyone at any time? Because that's really what it's about. That's where we're at right now. You can't have more than a handful of companies that are going to do the big Clay Christensen disruptive innovation. One, our economy can't handle it. We can't absorb it. And two, human behavior can't move that fast. I mean, how much, what next generation of the iPhone are we going to need next that is going to be any different than what we have now? And so at this company that has 85% engineers, the company is Qualcomm. An engineer had a great idea in robotics, and it would involve three other divisions within Qualcomm. But he had no idea who to turn to, no idea how to be mentored. And so we created this process where improvisational innovation was going to be a formal innovation process. And I'll give you the specifics here. And this is, this is Impact's journey. And this was going to be over the course of nine months from the inception of the idea. So it's announced in September, we're going to do the Impact journey where anybody can submit an idea. And what Qualcomm did in this case, you could definitely house a team out of HR to be this enabler of innovation but they decided they wanted to build it outside of, of HR. So they created an impact team. And this impact team vetted the approximately 300 ideas that came from around the world. And they did the first cutting of who was gonna continue on and who was gonna not make the cut at that time. But along the way, what we did was we helped create levers and processes so this person knew had to be mentored from different divisions. This person trained to be not just an engineer, but learned how to become an entrepreneur. And we would do everything possible to prep this inventor to be able to prototype and commercialize his or her idea. And so what they've done is just brilliant that I think everybody is going to want to learn from. And at the end of the nine-month process, what they do is they, a silent auction at the end where business leads come in and they go to like a science fair of all the projects that have made it this far. And individual business leads decide, do I want to fund this particular project? And if an invention gets picked up by a business unit, then they're responsible for financing it. And if not, the CEO of Qualcomm has himself put money into funding it like a venture capital firm. So that project will still move along, but it will stay within the impact program until it's ready to be considered again for prototyping and commercialization. So I can talk much more on just what this concept of improvisational innovation is about, but I'm getting the red light here. So, if I could just leave you with anything about Silicon Valley, again, it's, it's this mindset that anything is possible if you're committed to it, that you really can change cultures and change minds. And on that note, I thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that.